Welcome to Sea Time, everybody, the off-road show that brings you all the results, news, and online shenanigans that make being online a good time. We'd like to say thank you to Fly Racing for their support of Sea Time. Please go check them out at flyracing.com. I am Brian Pierce, your host for this fine evening. It is episode 206. Of course, there's a spot on the couch. My father is running late, but it's 8 o'clock and we need to be going live. In reality, it is 8.02, so we've got to keep on schedule. He, of course, will be waddling on in here soon, and we will just uh, make fun of him accordingly as we figure out what, uh, what debacle he's gotten himself into. Right, Stephen? Yep. Still need to get you a microphone. Yeah. Not at all. Um, all right, cool. Well, I'm sorry that we've been away for two weeks. I had a great time in Los Angeles. If you guys didn't get a chance to check any of that out, go to my Instagram account at Woody B. Pierced and follow all that. Of course, this is Sea Time, the off-road show for the on-road enth- online enthusiast and uh, the beer drinking penetration show to get you all your off-road greatness. Of course, I'm not drinking a beer. You should go to my Instagram account and see why. And I drank enough last week that I'm going to just take a little bit of a hiatus this week and have fun with it. But so... I we wanted to have somebody a little new on, and it was awesome because of the fact that we had so many new people on top of the podium on the East Coast at the OMAs of round two. We got to see Mike Witzkowski, and I might have said that wrong, but I'm going to say it just like the guy from Monsters, Inc., because that's the way it looks. <laughs> so we're, of course, going to find out if I said it right, wrong, or indifferent, um, but we got to ask first, Mike, how's your evening going, kind sir? Oh, it's going great, and uh, you might have said it a little bit wrong, but it definitely sounded, sounded pretty good. Close enough? Okay, so give us a lesson in the phonetics of how to pronounce your last name. Uh, it's pronounced Witkowski. Uh, most people forget the T, but yeah. Wit. So I got to bring in the T. Got it. Got it. Witkowski. I can figure this out. So uh, how close is that to uh, Mike? It, what is it? Mike Wukowski that was in Monsters Inc.? Yeah, they usually say Wazowski, but uh Ah, oh, Wazowski, I, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's what okay. I usually get uh everyone at the races usually says Wazowski or thinks my name's that usually, but it's pretty funny. How many times for Halloween have you gone as Mike Wazowski? Uh maybe only once actually. <laughs> Man, that's like a given. That's just like, you got to do that more often. I think it's kind of the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, so my dad's here. Dad, are you ready to sit down? Yeah. All right, come on. we got a seat for you. We're going to make fun of you. I don't really know that that's going to happen, but it's always good to talk about. Well, Mike, um, yeah, Colorado 500. No, oh, uh, Seat Time Adventures, but Colorado, of course. Um, so as we kind of bring in old man, uh, Mike, I just I really was happy to see you on the podium because it's great to see so many new dudes up there and but again being kind of in texas and so far away from some of the recent it looked like you guys had kind of a little bit of a mutter and that could have just been some of the pictures and maybe you guys did have good traction but you know we wanted to learn a little bit more about the oma uh there round two in missouri and kind of how everything went and then of course what kind of brought you onto the top step of the podium yeah definitely uh it yeah it actually started raining on lap one so yeah it was pretty it did get pretty muddy but then it stopped about halfway through but usually the omas are two moto format they're two 45 minute motos in the in the woods obviously but this one was two hours just because it was coast sanctioned with uh iowa but uh yeah i just been doing them because i mean they're obviously really good the tracks are really good and fresh and good single track and uh yeah it was it was a good race i was lucky to get up on the top step of the podium it was good fun but uh Stu had his issues but me and him at, have had a good year so far so it's been good right well um okay so tell me a little bit more about what you said about being co-sanctioned that's actually kind of interesting so you guys had a little bit of a different format this time when it comes to uh to the OMAs because of a co-sanctioning with one of the I- Iowa series? Right. Yeah, I'm pretty positive it's co-sanctioned with, like, Iowa. So it was, uh, it was two hours. But uh, usually, yeah, it's two 45-minute motos, which is pretty fun as well. Yeah. Do you think that the difference in the format this time played an advantage at any point to you? like, I, Or is it just kind of just a different style of racing at this point? 
Yeah, it definitely helped me, I think, because I usually race the GNTCs as well, so three hours, just an extra hour, obviously, but I think it helped in my role, actually, a little bit. Nice. Well, um, what bike were you on? Uh, KTM 250 two-stroke. KTM 250 two-stroke. Dad, when was the last time that you can remember riding a 250 two-stroke in the mud? In a while. I guess does the Can Am count? Oh, that was bloody, wasn't it? That was a 400. I guess I'd have to say early 90s, it was the RMX Suzuki. Oh, man. The 250 RMX. Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? Have you kind of gone back and forth on the two-stroke versus four-stroke battle? Have you tried a four-stroke and just keep finding yourself on a two-stroke, or have you just kind of stayed two-stroke? Uh, once I got on big bikes, I <clears throat> stayed two-strokes, and then last year I tried a four-stroke once. And it didn't really work, so I just went back to two strokes and what I know the best. But I just two strokes since I've been on big bikes. Yeah. Man, that's cool. So how long have you been on big bikes? You look like you might still be kind of a spring chicken. <laughs> uh, I think it's but a good four one. years now on big bikes. So you are uh, 20? No. 18. 18. Awesome. I like it. That's pretty bad, eh, dude, to get an OMA win uh, going on there. So tell me, uh, like, within the race, a two-hour long race, you know, it obviously differs because it's not as much of a sprint as it comes down to in the two 45-minute motos that you would typically have at the OMAs nowadays. Uh, what kind of battles did you wind up going through back and forth? Did you, you know, Who got the whole shot and, and how different fun things that happened within the actual race itself? Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting especially with the rain, but uh, I got whole shot, and uh, it was me, uh, Adam Bonaire, and uh, Drew Higgins, Stu was in the mix, and uh, yeah, actually, most of the race is pretty close, and uh, until about halfway through, I think, we were all, me, Stu, uh, and Drew Higgins were all really close, and then uh, we gassed a second time, and uh Stu had, I don't know, his bike wasn't starting or something, and I remember passing him, and then he had, he went out of the race, so he was out, and as me and my actual teammate, Drew Higgins, and uh, we went back and forth a few times, and then a few laps left, I just tried to check out and go, and that's what I did, and yeah, that's how it went, it was pretty good pretty good race and it's pretty fun yeah what do you think of uh drew higgins uh, that's a that's a local texas boy from around right around here yeah uh i did i didn't know he was from around there and he's a really real cool kid and great great rider as well man he is so quiet i don't know how how is he around you guys is he really quiet or is he a little bit more outgoing these days he's i mean i haven't really hung around him very much but actually at the race he came up and talked to me which was cool so we have a pretty good friendship going so it's pretty good i like it yeah no it was he would like never say anything in texas like he was always just really quiet and he just kind of look at me and laugh and then i didn't know if it was and then went out and rode like the dickens yeah and then like yeah he he spoke with his trophies yeah super super fast he's just he was always just kind of a quiet just kind of laid back dude but his his dad and i always drank beer and, and chatted it was a good time um well uh i saw nick ferringer up there but you didn't on the podium but you didn't really say much about him do you know kind of where he went and how his day was going uh yeah i actually did see him some some throughout the race. I only saw him once, actually. Yeah, when he was behind you. <laughs> yeah, he was he was riding good, and uh, I didn't, yeah I didn't really see him much to really tell you what really happened. But he, he had a better ride than he did the first round, is for sure. Yeah, well that's good to know. Yeah, uh, and then Stu Baylor, that kind of sucks for him. He's had a little bit of a little bit of bad luck. Um, we need to get him back on yeah. the bandwagon with uh, Grant Baylor going. And uh, did he, I wonder if, I never forgot to research that, if he wind up did breaking his collarbone or just kind of like tore some stuff or what that actually happened at that sprint enduro that he went and did. Hmm. The Baylor boys are having a little bit of bad luck. We don't need any more of that. Well, how long have you been on the RPM team and how's that been for you? This is my uh, first year with them and it's been great. They give me all the tools I need to 
win and it's it's awesome and what's the presence like at the events for you guys like i know with drew he's, he's kind of him and i remember i saw we talked with him and evan smith um kind of before some of the season had started you know and they get a you know they're kind of bouncing around to different places to go uh practice and things like that before races and after races is it kind of a little bit the same with yourself or do you have a different setup uh yeah it's basically the same yeah same deal as them really um kind of bouncing around but uh yeah my main focus is OMAs and GCCs and that's kind of what I've been doing and trying to win the OMAs yeah well okay so GNCCs how has that been going because so typically obviously we're talking about the OMAs being a 245 minute moto but the GNCs being three hours um, we're getting to have the limestone 100 coming up this weekend you know how has the GNCC season been treating you uh, not too good just because right before the round one I broke my collarbone ah. and uh, that really wasn't wasn't cool and then uh came back at steel creek had uh some mechanical issues which was a bummer as well and then uh south carolina i got sixth and then uh this last one um had another bike issue but limestone should be good it's home race indiana so it should be good Ooh, home race so you're from indiana right Nice. We didn't really get a chance to do any GNCCs, did we? Nope. Hmm. Those are Not national enduros, but yeah, we did a couple national enduros. Uh, GNCCs just never really. We didn't really do. We only did a couple hair scrambles, like whenever Sarah had one. Well, and our club put on uh, the Louisiana club put one on in the Scott Summers days. A GNCC. That's way back when. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. The guy on his XR six hundred just yep. kicking butt and taking names. Yep. Hmm. Well, I, I like that wouldn't. I don't know how that would work today, though. I think these these young whippersnappers would whippersnap him off the trail. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a little <laughs> bit older now too, so we'll see. I don't know. He could probably take Mike Wazowski, Witkowski. What if he can still press a six hundred? <laughs> I doubt it. Caleb Russell did it with his two fifty. I don't know. That's insane. Yeah, but his bike's way lighter than yeah. that XR six hundred for sure. I'm, All I'm right, glad so GNC is doing well on a two stroke two fifty. Who's that? I'm glad oh. to hear you're doing well on that because a lot of times especially in motocross, I don't know what happened at the professional level. There's a lot of those tracks, a two stroke two fifty would would be awesome. Yeah. The snappy power band coming out of corners. Oh well. Yeah, it's just the horsepower that you can get on those four strokes and the fact that you can make mistakes and in the face of a jump, yeah. just brap the shit out of it and okay. you're right back up to speed. Um, you know, it kind of... If you're in the wrong gear, it doesn't matter. Right. But you, you, didn't, you didn't blend with the four stroke like you did with, with the two stroke. Which size four stroke were you riding? Uh, 250. Uh, it was the new style. I liked it a lot. I just... So I used to two strokes, and then uh, engine braking kind of hurt me on the four stroke. I wasn't used to that. Did you try uh, a recluse clutch? Just a random question. No, just a uh, regular clutch. That's the one thing that helped me uh, get a little bit more used to it is the recluse clutch uh, helps with engine braking. And it's really interesting. I asked Brian's story, like, how do you go back and forth so easily between two strokes and four strokes because of engine braking? Like, that's like the one thing I can't ever get used to quickly is the lack of it and then it being there again. And he goes, right. I don't know. It never bothers me. I guess it's just the way that I learned to ride being, you know, that I learned to ride correctly. And I was like, oh, it's like, shut up. So I pull in the clutch. Yeah. He's like, you pull in the clutch and you don't get injured braking. I was just like, thanks, Brian. But it's there thanks. if you need it. Yeah, I know. I was like, oh, okay, whatever, whatever, whatever. So, a lesson for both of us, Mike. We should just pull in the clutch, and we wouldn't get engine braking. Plus, right? you don't you don't get a lot of flywheel effect in the engine. Yeah, with, there with you a go. 252 stroke, you don't have all the inertial force of the machine moving around. Oh yeah, and it doesn't overheat like a bitch like it, it did. In TKO. Well, it can, it can. Two strokes overheat too. Yeah. This is true. Especially in the mud. Did, you have, did anybody have overheating problems in the mud? 
when the radiators got all caked up and the bikes weighed 100 extra pounds? Yeah, mine got a little overheated. Uh, that last GNCC mutter, actually, radiators got clogged. Yeah. That's, yep. They can overheat, too. So... What are you going to be doing this summer when you guys take a little bit of a break? I don't know what the OMA schedule looks like, but I know GNCC always seems to take about a month to two month break. What do you have any big plans to kind of, you know, either a take a break or b act, you know, train and ride and do something different? Yeah, uh, I might. I think there there are some OMAs, but uh, I'll probably try some sprint enduros and. Uh, Definitely keep the training going, and I like to mountain bike a lot and run and go to different places to mountain bike that are real mountainous, I guess, and uh, just like have that. fun with it. He's like, I don't like to ride my mountain bike on flat stuff. I want mountains. Mountainous. <laughs> That's good. Makes it fun, I guess. No, yeah. I would I would totally agree. There's a couple of trails. Well, by Arkansas? a couple, I mean two. Yeah, Arkansas has got good stuff, but... Uh, in Texas, that uh, you got to go about an hour, hour, 15 minutes, but there's a place called Big Cedar, and they actually have some really fun, uh, fast, quick elevation changes. Now, granted, the climbing's not long, but it's like short and steep, and so it can still, right. it could still burn out a guy like me who's just, you know, just in enough shape to get himself into trouble, not actually good enough shape to do well at it. So. <laughs> But at 18 and uh, winning OMAs, I'm sure that your your talent on all of the two wheeled machines is is far beyond my own. I like to drink too much beer; that's half my problem. <laughs> it's good beer, though. It's good beer. You can't have uh, beer yet. Right, right. That's a thing. It's laws. I don't know. It's really weird. Well, cool, dude. Well, I'm glad that you got a win. I appreciate you coming on the show and having so much fun with us. Uh, you tell us, what are some things that we didn't ask that you've got coming up or that you just didn't get a chance to talk about or any of that stuff? I don't know. Maybe it's your favorite color. You like long walks on the beach. <laughs> um, uh, well, there's not really much I can think of, but uh, if you have anything you want to ask, well, I got one. Uh, Go for any, it. Any changes you made to your suspension for a, a real mudder? And, you know, knowing you're going to carry a whole lot of mud, but yet you don't want it to be too stiff. Well, what kinds of changes did you make to your suspension? Shoot, you could even say what kind of changes did you make to the bike. But I think suspension's a great place to start. Right. I feel like suspension's, like, the biggest key to winning in general. But uh, um, we... S- Usually stiffen it up, and uh, I run my sag kind of high, which helps. So then, when it gets caked on, it then it's back to normal a little bit, so it doesn't obviously weigh so much. But and uh, yeah, I really just kind of stiffen it up a little bit. Interesting, but you stiffen it up because of the fact that you know you're going to be picking up extra weight, so that that way it doesn't wind up kind of sitting in the travel as much because of the extra weight being picked up from the mud right right so it doesn't like yeah sag a lot and interesting you, and that's yeah, both ends you, you try to keep both ends pretty much equal if you stiffen up one right, end you stiffen right. up the other end right right I think a lot of people forget about that you know you can't change the rear end and not change the front end and oh yeah trying to, to keep it keep yeah. it uh, right excuse me it's going it to turn into a Harley Davidson on you <laughs> it's a chopper with a, with a chopper front end. The James you don't Stewart keep to them it. together. Yeah. Well, um, what other kind of changes would you make to the bike? I mean, did you go? Oh my God, it's going to rain, and so you got to like pack everything up with foam and all the other stuff. Yeah, uh, we pack actually like the the whole radi or the air box is like we waterproof it, foam it all up, foam the vents, and. Uh, we actually have this cool little thing that goes over the air filter for water that KTM kind of made for us, and it's like a rubber thing that goes over and uh, makes it full waterproof. And then we run a um, like a dust cover over the main filter mm-hmm. so we don't suck any water. And then yeah, just foam the rest of the bike, the skid plate, and uh, that's about on it really just yeah. maybe duct tape the handguards and all that good stuff 
Wait, why do you duct tape the handguard? So that you can like pull it off and so the mud comes with the duct tape or? Yeah, sometimes, but uh, usually just so none gets on my uh, grips or gloves because mine are kind of narrow, I guess you could say. So I just duct tape the tops or the bottom so no water or mud splashes <clears throat> under or on the top. Okay, so you make them a little bit taller. Yeah, like right, a little right. flap uh, on your visor. Yeah. And then did you do the fun little uh, extra lens glued to your Oh, yeah, yeah, your visor? definitely on the helmet too. Yeah. yeah, so you look awesome. That was yeah. fun to see everybody this weekend with uh, at the Supercross with all of their crazy that's ideas. That's what you're supposed to do with all your old goggle lenses, you know? Yeah, just you hang, save them, hang them for them a muddy day to put them on the front of your <laughs> Duct tape visor. them on there. Yeah. That would be fun Recycle. to do that with the mustache duct tape. Yeah. Like duct tape it on there with that. You know that little filter you were talking about, that uh, dust filter that you're putting over your uh, regular air filter? You know where yeah. that started? Ladies' nylons. Yeah, pantyhose. We used to use pantyhose. We're talking way back when. Then somebody came out with them as a product. Well, it's like a filter skin, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what but yeah. it used to right. be ladies' pantyhose. You'd, you'd put it, cut it up and put it around your filter on a, on a dusty day, and then whenever you get to the gas stop or something, you just pull that off. New filter. And you're good to go. Right. Well, well, think of uh, of technology and, and how far we've come. I was talking about Brian's story. If you watch him take his helmet off every single time, he still has a maxi pad on his forehead. Like <laughs> all the technology and all the fun wick dry shit that's out there, and like he still uses a maxi pad. Maybe <laughs> maybe ladies' pantyhose would be just as good, but we're sold on this technology that uh, that the filter skins are better because it's branded and marketed. Well, it is better. It, it, the pantyhose were I don't know. not Panty, as good as the filter skins. could be just as good, and we're just but I'd like to know what these to rubber believe. items from KTM were that uh, waterproof the box without air proofing the box. You still got to get air into the motor, and if you tape well, yeah. off everything, you you, you know uh, you can't get air to the motor. Yes. So tell us then, now that you've waterproofed the air box, how did it get air in there? <laughs> Uh, or is it only from well, the top, like by the seat, I guess? Well, like the on the KTMs, the vents on the sides, just foam. But it's like a it's like a vented foam, basically. So you still get air in there. And then the top's still breathable. It's not like fully shut off, I guess. Yeah. So it's still, still breathable. It's just water-resistant, mud-resistant a little bit better than without the foam. I like it. But you know how, you know how, uh, whoo, hello. You know how Can M figured that out, right? Uh uh-uh. uh. They breathe behind the number plate. Oh, that's and right. And it goes down the backbone of the frame into the airbox. But that's old technology. Yeah, and then you're like, yeah, never mind. I was going to say something. And if you got the filter stupid. wet that way, a wet filter was the least of your problems. Yeah, you were upside down in a bog yeah. or something. Because behind your number plate usually doesn't get wet. <laughs> it does with me because <laughs> I put a water bottle back there. Yeah. <laughs> all the fun stuff well what's um what's the limestone supposed to be like this weekend how's the weather looking i'm sure you've already checked that out yeah it doesn't look too good looks a little like rainy all week and the on the weekend doesn't look too bad but i think it's probably going to be slick and wet but mm. my prediction mm. so what are your thoughts on caleb russell being as badass as he's been <laughs> but having such a slow start to the year. Yeah, I mean he's been killing it, but he did have that knee injury he was coming off of. So. Oh yeah. That was probably his slow start, but he's it's on top now. It's pretty intense, man. Like it's just like what the deuce. Like how do you, you know? And it sucked for Josh Strain to have such a poor race at that last event. But I think he had some bike trouble and couldn't get it started, and then had you know finally did get it going. But he finished, you know, so far down that he has a significant points difference now. You, you know, unless he would have finished second, and it would have been semi close still. But it was right, kind of a bummer for him. He had such a fantastic beginning of the year that it kind of all turned around on both of them. Right. Yeah, he's right. He was riding good, and it was cool to see him up there as well. Get back into leading the points and everything too. Yeah. Well, again, congratulations and yeah. keep up the good work. Yeah, man. And uh, when you're up Thanks. on the, when you're up on the podium this week, you got to remember you just got to be like seat time. 
<laughs> we'll be rooting Sounds for you. Sounds good, yeah. If I, when I get on the podium this weekend, I'll definitely say that. I like it. And you can do it Eisenhower, or you can do it however you want. It's okay. I, whatever. Just have fun with it. Definitely. <laughs> awesome, man. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks again for having fun with us, and we'll uh, see you soon. Thanks, and man. Thanks for the tips. Yeah. yeah. Keep keep your it. keep your bike clean and not muddy, I guess, right? Yeah, definitely. We will. We will. <laughs> Be in the lead. Thanks for having yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Take it easy. Bye Congrats bye. again. We'll see you. Bye. Yeah, that's so thanks for coming. Uh, I'm sorry that you had to wind up coming a little late, but you had to come a little bit further this time. So for those of you guys who kind of missed two weeks ago, we um we're at our new space and we're still figuring things out. We did get the seat time backdrop over here. Um, but we haven't attached everything. We've got a lot of audio issues to kind of keep working around um, logistics when it comes to how our setup is and everything like that. Like it, it's, it'll be a long road. So if it seems like we're a little, you know, flustered sometimes, we're kind of just trying to make it work at this point and and, and make sure that we keep bringing you guys fun, awesome content and having fun riding dirt bikes and beer drinking and binge racing. Um, at least we don't have to keep the dogs and the kids out of the studio. I know at this point we're we're uh, we're kind of into our own groove and we can kind of do what we wanted to do. I mean, in, in reality, if we were to be able to, if we were in one of those situations where we were closer to more riders, you know, we could get some 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 pros to come to us. You know, we could literally we have enough room now that we could have people come to us to watch the show live. Um, and that would be one thing that we would love to do. Um, we've also been ta trying to talk out and reach out to other people about potentially doing web shows here that are or are not related to motorcycles. You know, we've got all the technology. We can kind of do that kind of stuff. So, again, like if you guys have fun and fun and random weird ideas, you know, we're here in McKinney, Texas, and we would love to try to figure out how we can kind of make that work. Um, so you had some interesting theories when we were watching. So again, if you haven't followed my Instagram account, it's at Woody B. Pierce. And when there's some stuff about the cabin from this past weekend, the dad and I and the family were moving into the, the new kind of investment property rental cabin that we've got going on, um, which you can rent. It's called the broken spoke. It's in broken bow, Oklahoma. It's on a website. Go find it. Um, broken bow cabin lodging.com. Is that too much of a plug, Steven? Yeah, it's go your show. It. It's your cabin. Yeah, <laughs> do it. Um, but so we were watching Supercross Saturday night, and you, I, I kind of, I think at first I was kind of like, yeah, awesome mud race. It's going to be crazy. This will be great for the final race. Like we actually get to see some fun racing. But you had some other thoughts on that, and it kind of turned me around a little bit. So I was wondering if you wanted to kind of talk to your points about well, why a mud race like that isn't the best for these kinds of situations. It, it's not the best because there's too many outside factors that can affect the championship. Mm -hmm. Now, the 450s were, Over. were finished. Yeah. yeah, it was just but for second and third. But both 250 right? think, yeah. championships were at risk to the leader. And in, in Webb's case, he almost lost it yeah. by one position. You know, and the, and the injury he had, et cetera, et cetera. But in a mud race like that, there's, there's so many outside forces that can intervene in the championship. You know, you want the best man to win. Right. And in conditions like that, it's not always the best man that wins. It's maybe the guy who doesn't have the other people fall down in front of him. Uh, you know, things like that. But More a mud factors race, come into play. A mud race play, just brings yeah. so many extraneous factors in. You hate to see careers... You hate to see family incomes, things like that, affected by a mud race. But fortunately, right? Yeah, everything. It didn't. Yeah, because it didn't. as you were saying, like once you once they all the points kind of filtered out, yeah. the ones that were leading were still the ones still that, that walked away with the championship. The second and third might have been changed mixed up, up a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. But as far as the record books, the, as far as I'm concerned, the right thing happened. The people who were leading substantially were not damaged by a mud race right because you've seen that that happens all the time absolutely it almost happened to dungy of course he'd already won the thing right but uh you know and then one one comment on that um is this with roxon yeah like when he ran over roxon um <laughs> take that the announcer said well you know dungy's on drier ground dungy's got hand guards so he's up and running the one thing they didn't say is dungy had an electric starter uh, you had this. You watched Roxon kicking his brains out on that on that Suzuki, 
Whereas when Dungey rode the bike, he hit the button and off he went. Was it, who was talking? Was it Ralph Shaheen or was it Jeff Emmett? Jeff. And that's interesting because Jeff's smart enough to know that, but I wonder if Jeff is smart enough to have not said anything because he still rides a bike. You could see it. And for a bike with the kickstart. Yeah, anybody who was watching could see it. That's interesting. And they didn't, and, uh, they didn't make a comment about it. And so by the time Roxon got up and running, Dungey was long gone. Magic button. That's awesome. It, it is kind of interesting that more manufacturers haven't ad- adopted um, and the brought research that over. research getting the weight down? And, and how many people want to give up a Kickstarter? Yeah. And take the Kickstarter off the bike to save three, four pounds. Oh, what if my electric starter doesn't work? Blah, blah, blah. So Harley's there's, there's been risk. And, and the other manufacturers just haven't committed the money yet. To make it work. Yeah. Well, I mean, we see now with the FX models in the Yamaha and the YZs, you know, now they have kind of their race bikes with, you know, running those. They're not, they're, they're, they're not kind of the more they're not motocross. They're not, the, they're off road. They're not the, they're, but they're their off road race machines. Yes. Um, and so maybe, I mean, fingers crossed that might, that might be kind of R and D on their part to kind of see if it's something that could be viable. Uh, to, again, to keep playing with the weight and things like that, but isn't doesn't Dungey have like a little? I mean, like a featherweight of a battery that's probably yeah. the size of the stuff you use with your model airplanes. Yeah, like, you know, it's probably a bunch of D cells or C cells or yeah. double A's that are rechargeable. Yeah, because it it just I mean, they're out there it for what much. thirty minutes at most, twenty minutes at most in Supercross. Well, and it's not a drain because it is charging, and it does have to run the. You've got to have a battery anyway for fuel injection. Mm-hmm. Why not have an electric starter? I, I don't understand. That is a weird, awesome point. We've you got to have the battery today. Maybe it's just a bunch of double A cells. So make a little bit heavier battery, put an electric starter on it, off you go. I noticed the. Uh, what's that? Oh, is it up? Hmm, whoops. We got to get a microphone on this man, yeah. and a, and a and a camera. Stephen came out that uh, one of the guys in the chat room, and Brian will tell you who it is in a minute, says that Yamaha is talking about a hydraulic clutch. Yeah, so that's what's saying. The MXGP guys and Reed have a hydraulic clutch and the electric start. We saw the Honda guys too for a while playing around with electric cl- uh, hydraulic clutches, and I actually think it was when Reed was on Honda with 2 Motorsports when he started originally was on Honda still. He was doing hydraulic clutch, mm. though it was obviously aftermarket. Um, who knows what these are? They, I don't know. Are these the, the, the YGTR? What is the Yamaha Racing YTGR, YGTR? Um, They're a little race brand. Jesse Peters in the chat room, if you know, let me know. Like what? It, let us know if these are... Aftermarket products that are just complete third party, or if they're Yamaha products that you can buy aftermarket. GYP? GYP, something like that? I don't know. Man, I'm turning into an idiot. It's, I'm blanking here. Um, you made an interesting point that the battery thing is what blows me in mind. You wouldn't even, I didn't even think of that. Like with EFI, yes, you have to have some kind of a battery to run those kinds of things to go. <laughs> for it to know, it's running a computer that tells it how much gas to put into, um, into the engine. GYTR, yes. GYTR, that was okay. We were so close. Yeah. yeah, so I wonder if it's the GYTR aftermarket part, but the Huskies just got released today, um, or the bikes anyway, like what they're going to be. And the so you know how ignition mapping, you could map the whole, right? Well, now you can separately map each gear, including your entire map. So before you were just able to like map essentially just what your throttle global. would do, like, yeah. right, like how how the bike would uh, respond, and now you can literally map each individual gear. So if you wanted to, you know, some people would take first gear and just make it essentially worthless. So they'd always start in second, and then second, third, like, so that's interesting. And I personally have no idea how I would even handle trying to figure out how to test that. That would be such a weird growing thing for me to 
You know what I mean? It almost seems like, uh, and I'm not sure the value there, but it seems like load and RPM are how you ought to work the mapping. What gear you're in, you could be a quarter throttle, half throttle, full throttle in a gear, Mm -hmm. but it's the load on the engine and the RPM that determines the timing and the amount of fuel that ought to get squirted. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm an old carburetor guy. Now, it could be the way that it was explained is they related it to engine mapping, but this adjustment that you now have may be something a little bit more intricate. Like I know, say, if there was a way, you know, like with gearing, so what does it become, stock with 1350 nowadays on a, on a KTM? You know, you go, I go up to like a 51 or a 52. I because, dropped the counters too. Because counter that, that, that third gear, that, that space between second and third gear always feels weird. So to kind of go, Ooh, I need to shift that so that I can then ride in third gear more and kind of have that be my, my, my priority gear. I go up to that 51, that 52, so I wonder if there's some weird adjustment that they've come up with in the actual mapping that instead of me needing to... No, it would make sense because, I mean, then in reality, like, you still can change. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, I guess we'll find out. It'll be interesting. Uh, you guys, you're probably smarter than I am at this point, so I would, I would say let us know if you're in the chat room to let us know. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, too, so um, everything... Oh, one other thing about hydraulic clutches oh, yeah, and things. It. Now that uh, gas gas is coming back, that means Hebo products are coming back. And I don't know if you remember, but I put an aftermarket Hebo hydraulic clutch on my Yamaha 400. Yeah, I do remember that. And made it night and day difference. It went from a bike that stalled in every corner because the clutch was three bears to pull it. Yeah to a Hebo hydraulic clutch that never faded. Yeah, because it's, hy- it's hydraulic right. all the way until it gets the cable pull, right? And then it's just a cable that... It, or- then it, no, it had a little push rod, but it was, a, it was just a, a hydraulic uh, Hebo clutch that worked perfectly on the Yamaha. Hmm. So if you don't have one, now the gas gas is back, look into Hebo clutches. Interesting. Well, there you go. That was a guest we had on before. Yeah, so, yeah, and that's a good point, Jesse, is that the fact that it's, like, not sure if they're aftermarket or not, but since they're, those guys are factory Yamaha, you know, there's a good chance that they're, they're, they could potentially be testing kind of that 2017, 2018 product line. Um, but, you know, shit, we'll, we should be seeing some 2017 and Yamahas being released any time now. maybe coming off their street racing bikes, too. Yeah. Their pavement racing program. That's where the Yamaha engines came from. Yep. You know, with the engine technology, the five valves and all of that that they started with that came off their street racing program. Nice. It'll be fun. All right. Well, you've got a map of Colorado with you. Tell us a little bit about this. Actually, the Gunnison Basin. Colorado's you have a map a of the Gunnison Basin. That would be a big map. Um, well, yeah, it would. But what, what I did was I made sure that, that I drew out <clears throat> number two software, um, the, what we did last year for Sea Time Adventures. And, uh, you know, it, I think we'll have it on the website if we don't have it now, but we'll have pictures of different days. And, like, day, day one was, was really a kind of fun day. You know, if, if you know the Taylor Park area, you'll know things like Dead Man, uh, 755, 744, Double Top, American Flag, Italian Mountain, Cedar 411. Creek. You know, if, if this is all day one. Yeah. Those are destinations in themselves with lunch at uh, South Crested Butte and then back into it. Awesome pizza. You know, Cement Mountain and, and some of those areas. Then day two, we wound up uh, down with lunch in, pardon me if I read my map, I'm sorry, Tin Cup, at least I can read it. I, that's, it sounds like winning. Uh, with lunch at Tin Cup and if you like things like Union Park and Fossil Ridge uh, slaughterhouse, you know, all these things you've heard of before, Carbonate Hill, th- these again are individually awesome trails, and that was all day two. Day three was, was shaped like a hot dog, really. Uh, started out at our base camp, and base camp was near Dinner Station, and this is the day that wound up going uh, most, of, most of Fossil Ridge, west of the wilderness, and we wound up actually down in Almont. For for, oh yeah, for lunch. That's where we fixed my tire. Yep. 
you know, and all of the trails back up in there, they don't have names, but they have numbers like 743 and, uh, and some of those. That's what we did day three. Now, day four, we were supposed to have lunch. <laughs> we were supposed to have lunch. Turned into dinner. In Pitkin. Well, the day was so aggressive. That was the Timberline Trail. Yep. Anybody been on the Timberline Trail? It's a butt kicker. Um, we started out in the base camp, which was fairly close to the beginning of the Timberline, and then they, they took it all the way down into the Pitkin area where they started looking at things like uh, Kamichi Pass. That was a bitch. <laughs> you know, even, on the, even on the Utes. Uh, granite. They, w they also uh, uh, did the railroad station. There are all kinds of things there. Alpine Tunnel, I think they call it. Mm -hmm. Quartz Creek. I mean, there are just... Alpine Tunnel, is that where we went? That's where we went and went uh, sightseeing, right? Where the, where the train is? Yeah, you hike train, in to yeah. see the old, the old yep. uh, tunnel. Hiking in Colorado with your motorcycle gear on sucks. It, well, yeah. And then what they were supposed to do was have lunch at Pitkin, but the day, especially on Timberline because a little wet, was so long that they came dragging in. They basically had some snacks that the support crew provided and that they carried on the bikes. You know, we made sure everybody had gas. Uh, we carried it on the UTVs and then said goodbye and off, off you went. Round two. Uh, but man, alive, you guys never came in at night, but that was a long, long day. And then with the UTVs, we had a great time that day going up the mountains, you know, seeing different, different mountains I hadn't even been on before because that's an area of, of the Taylor Park area that I had not been to. Yeah. Except in a four-wheeled truck. Um, so I enjoyed that on the Ute, trying to chase Steven on his. He's fast. <laughs> I had no trouble with his dad, but, boy, he's fast. And, uh, and he's on a, what, 800? How many years old is it, Stephen? Yeah, mine's an 800, uh, 2011. Oh, it's a five-year-old 800. Of course, my Razor 1000 that I rented, um, I had some fun. But I think everybody had a great day. That's where we got the, uh, uh, the quadcopter shots of you guys oh, crossing yeah, yeah. the river when the, when the helicopter would, would go backwards and watch you guys coming across the bridge at Te Texas Creek, I think it was? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's correct. And see, you guys were two hours late to that. Yeah. And that's only a third of the way, third of your day. But I think everybody, you know, I think I remember Jordan, when we caught up with you guys, I think it was after Kamichi, Jordan said she got off the bike, lay down, and crashed. You know, she just took a nap. She was so tired. Yeah, dude, it was, um, it was a rough day. And it's just because of the fact that it was just a little slick. And so everything kind of wore you out just a little bit more because yeah. you were ping, pin pinballing just, off just of everything. Remember, just remember, two months more. later for the KTM rally, yeah. all of that was bone dry well, and dusty slick. We're going uh, what, a, year, a week earlier this year, yeah. right? And so yeah. there's a chance that it could be still slick because of snow, snow melt. And that kind of stuff. And we know that, but it's just kind of fun, you know. Have a scene, find, running across snow, that's just a, a good, fun day. You can make yellow yeah. snow. I mean, who doesn't enjoy doing that? Well, remember when you had to pack snow in your radiator? Yep. That's one of the things. Thank Oops. you to uh, Malcolm Smith. To, to making accidents happen. Thanks to Malcolm Smith, we had to pack. Uh, Got to say that carefully. Snow. Can't say Malcolm Stewart. Because sometimes they would say Malcolm Smith yeah. when he was first starting to race. Oh, that's true. That's true. And he's named after Malcolm Smith. Did you know that? Uh -oh. Malcolm Stewart's Malcolm is named after Malcolm Smith. Oh, I didn't know that. How did you know that? They said it. Oh. And did he Ralph say that, yes, that's the case? Yeah. A little tidbit. Interesting. So that's the kind of fun we had last summer. And this summer it's going to be a little bit different. I think it, by everybody being at the same base camp, I think that's going to make it better. You know, yeah. Typically breakfasts we wander down to Taylor Park store. They have a fabulous, fabulous uh, breakfast there. And then a store for anybody who wants to buy munchies to just take along. Uh, dinner will be provided by the, the event at, at base camp for everybody. Lunches will be on the trail. If they're at a restaurant, you know, everybody will pay for their lunch. If we have to do like we did on day four and just meet you guys somewhere, we'll have extra munchies and water and gas and whatnot with us on the support vehicles. Yep. It's going to be a good time. Don't, if you missed last summer, don't miss this summer. 
Yeah, because this may be the last time we ride in Colorado for a while. We've been talking with some friends of ours about going to a different place next year. We found a couple different people that could really help us out to go essentially to another location. Um, and, you know and where the KTM rally is this year? Where is this year? Sturgis this year? It's west of Sturgis in west Deadwood. Of Deadwood? All of the trails up in the Black Hills is where the KTM rally is in later this year. That sounds pretty epic. Yeah. Maybe we should just start following them around, just show up like a week before. Well, and then I can halfway Then you, then you can just hang and out and just do the, the KTM rally afterwards. Yeah, just keep all the maps. <laughs> they give us, they give us uh, GPS coordinates for all the trails. Yeah, so if Brady Davis is paying attention, I apologize that it's been so hard for me to get back to you. Uh, we're as excited as well. Um, as you can tell, we've been moving around into this place, and we've just had so much other stuff going on. So Dad's trying to start taking the reins, kind of trying to organize a little bit better um, just because I've been kind of I've been dropping the ball, so it's unfortunate. But if anybody does will still want to come with us to Seat Time Adventures 2.0, please reach out. We do have a couple more spots left available, and as he mentioned, we're going to be kind of putting the wagons together there in Taylor Park, riding for four days, uh, and we've got a couple dudes down that you know that are probably going to help us sponsor with some beer. Got a home brewer that's going to help us out, and it, I think it's going to be another fantastic time, if not better have this year. So steaks every night. Uh, you cooking them? Well, they may be tube steaks if I'm cooking them. No. Then you know what a tube steak is? It's right? a hot dog. Yeah. And I'm not going to be eating a hot dog. Cut. The Enduro dinner for us when, I, when he was growing up was tube oh. steaks in ramen noodles yeah. with cheese. Yep. That's about the limit of my cooking. So, no, I'm not cooking. No, you're not cooking. Um, and, yeah, another highlight is the fact that if you come this year, it's going to be if, – if you haven't watched the video, definitely go watch the video. Stephen and I – and everyone had some form of device that we were filming with this past year. But Rob Mitchell is actually going to be coming with us on c -Tab Adventures and doing the videography for us. So the level of the footage will be 800 times better. Can I still um, take my so quadcopter? Absolutely. You just need to start practicing. I want to get some shots from the top of American Flag Mountain. I do too. Because unfortunately, we got to the base of it. But there were, what, 200 horses at yep. the top? They were talking to us about horses and all that yeah. stuff, and we didn't want to be a bunch of jerks, right. which is understandable. So I hope you guys are uh, okay with the Caselli jersey and the NOEA being back up. I, we even had a comment from someone from two weeks ago that it's not the same without the Caselli jersey, and I, I can't agree more. So I wanted to make sure that this week we got the background in and we got everything back up. I think what I'm going to do is hang up some of the jerseys on the side so it's a little bit easier for me to switch them out. Caselli jersey pretty much always it has a special place in my heart, um, so I don't think that that would be much of a rotating jersey, but I do think the one on the other side would be fun. So again, if you do have jerseys that you would like to uh, donate to the show, then we can get them back later on in life and all that stuff um, to have us kind of like keep a rotating journey in the show yeah. and people that pay attention and have fun with us. If you've got weird T-shirts, um, I had uh, John Scholemeyer send me his Wieners in the Woods shirt. And it sounds weird, but it's probably maybe his Saturday evening shenanigans, but it's also the name of a team he had when he did the off-road cup. So I've got one of those shirts. Like, so it's like fun stuff like that. So if we could start to collect a lot of those kind of things within your journey of being an off-road dirt bike uh, enthusiast, uh, it's that much more fun. I and think. Don't forget the Caselli Foundation, but what he really stood for was give back. Yeah, You know, the night that, that you and I spent with him after the Supercross, yeah. when he went through the kids program and the amount of work that he did to put into that, I mean, he worked as hard at give back. Now he got paid for it, okay. Yeah. But he worked as hard at giving back well, I mean, I really think that that's just as like, he worked yeah, at like developing he himself. He could have shown up, high-fived the kids, and they would have paid for him to get there. It would have been a salary thing, so it wouldn't have been nothing extra. And he could have, they could have, that could have been it. But well, that's not Kurt Caselli. That's not Kurt Caselli. Uh, it wasn't. He was so involved with that kind of stuff, and I think that that's awesome. I just wish that there was a chance for us to be able to be as involved. We're just in Texas, so it's kind of tough to do. Um, I don't know. Maybe Ricky's the next Caselli, Ricky Brayback. Yeah, that'd be cool, but he's still not in Texas. We're in Texas. We're stuck here. But give back is give back. All across the world, we get so much out of motorcycling Please, we have to remember, give back to yep. the next generation. Or it's not going to happen. You know, who's going to cut the trails? It's not going to be us old guys that cut the first two rounds of trails. It's going to have to be the next generation. Yep. Going to have to give back. 
Yep. Um, and pay attention to Instagram uh, this evening and possibly tomorrow. Uh, we have a surprise for everybody. It'll be fun. Um, so before I let you go, I did want to give you the Monday Dirt Buzz. If you guys haven't gotten that yet, we'll do that and wrap up and say thank you to our sponsors. That's obviously thank you, Dad, for coming this way. We'll talk, talk, we'll talk I, a little bit more. I only got lost twice coming to the new location. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit more about Sea Time Adventures and yeah, uh, so discipline me everything. Later. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, Shame on you, old man. Uh, so works round seven this past weekend. Mesquite MX in Mesquite, uh, Nevada. Uh, Dalton Sherry getting his second win in a row. I tried to get him on the show, but I didn't hear back from him. Second, it was Eric Yorba. And third, Justin Wallace. Uh, Robbie Bell actually in 10th place. Wound up having a rock uh, either slice a radiator hose or slice into his radiator, losing his coolant and kind of – and it didn't – it you made it story. sound like he caught it. But you couldn't really tell, like, if it did seize or if he caught it before it seized. But still, like, even if it overheated that much, he's probably going to have to go through it just to make sure it's not galled or anything like that. Oh, and I went by everything. So, and then OMA, this past weekend we had round two in Memphis, Missouri. And we saw that Mike Witkowski got first, Drew Higgins in second, and Nick Ferringer in third. And that's awesome for those guys. Mm-hmm. Um to see Mike Witkowski get second in our Steve local Levine, Texan. Steve a local from second. Missouri. Yeah, and then That's Steve Levan. That, and that dude has been winning for a long-ass yeah. time. He has maybe as many blackjack overalls as anybody. Yeah. Steve Levine it's is fast. crazy. Yeah, he just keeps on keeping on. Uh, AMA East Hair Scrambles Championship Round 3 in Hurricane Hills Hair Scramble Clifford, Pennsylvania We saw Jesse Grome in first Thorne Devlin in second And Wally Palmer in third It's good to see Wally Palmer out there Wally Palmer is just a treat for everybody He can, he could do really well if he wasn't doing it always for the fans But he does it for the fans And that's just what happens uh, The Netra Championship Hair Scramble Series Round 2 Nutmeg in Eastford, Connecticut uh, we saw Josh Toth in first, Ben Kelly in second, and John Kelly in third. I don't know if they're brothers, but there's a small assumption that they could be. The Alessis are. Uh, the Alessis. <laughs> uh, let's, let's talk about the Alessis. The Indiana Cross Country Racing Series was round four. They had King of the Mountain. Steven, King of the Mountain. Mountain, mountain. Not the, King the of the Moto. Awesome. King of the Mountain. In uh, Indiana, so uh, first place was Levi Keller, second in Derek Allen, and third, Austin Lee. Of course, this, uh, all this information gets posted early on Monday morning by Dale Spangler on DirtBuzz.com. So he scours the internet and all the results and gets in touch with series and puts all of that in one place for you over the weekend. You need to go check out DirtBuzz.com. He works very hard to make sure that you guys have this information. And he puts a ton of information into his features, which I think are something that nobody does anymore. Um, but I, I get it. There's very, there's very little return um, on why a lot of people do it. They don't see the, the, the financial gain in it, but he's a great editorial if writer. You, if so. you have to get paid to do what you love, you don't love it. I mean, you don't get paid to do this. I don't get paid to do this. Stephen doesn't get true. paid to do this. But we love dirt bikes. Yep. It's as simple as that. So go check out dirtbuzz.com. Do it for the love, man. And, of course, our sponsors, flyracing.com. Um, it's getting hot. It is, like, super muggy. It is disgusting and we, weird in Texas right now. We had the hottest oh. day of the year today. Yeah. 93 degrees it was in nasty. North Texas. So I'm just saying, like, go prepared. Oh, they're cousins. Jesse Peters, you're on it. I just want to say thank you <laughs> for keeping me on my toes. Because it's, it's, Steven's typically the one doing it. But Jesse Peters, thumbs up to you, my son, my friend. I say that because I'm always doing that to my son. I apologize. You're not my kid. And if you are, I apologize even more. Um, we need to have your son. Liam? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know how that's going to go. Well... He, he'll last Squirrel. for five minutes before he, his attention span wanes, but, you know, he's got his strider bike. He's got stories he can tell. Maybe we'll have a Bad segment idea. that we record and play in the show. That, there you go. Bad idea. That's and I'll have an update on my 690 here if, whenever I get off my butt and finish it. Oh, nice. And then we'll be able to do another video. And, and you've then had I'll it be for... able to have an update on my 990 for sale. <sighs> Finally. Holy shit. Um, so 
Yeah, so flyracing.com. We're talking about being muggy. Go get yourself some kinetic gear because, oh, my gosh, I can't even imagine riding this stuff right now with any kind of regular gear. You need to be able to breathe. So go get yourself some fly racing kinetic gear from your local dealer or from flyracing.com. And then, of course, we're talking about riding off-road. We're talking about going to ride in Colorado. We're going to get yourself some equilibriums or some super stickies from the guys over at Kenda Tire. So uh, what's awesome is that majority of the off-road races that you're going to go to, you can find someone there that's going to have Kenda tires. So you can do like what we did, where we showed up and we knew, okay, we're going to come in. Can you have some tires ready for us? Yes, we can. We go over there. We changed them so we didn't have to pay them anything, but you can gladly give them a couple bucks and they will change those tires for you and make all that happen. Uh, I think that's a fantastic service, and I'm glad that those guys are doing that. So definitely support Kenda Tire and check them out and run some of their stuff at the races and have fun with it. I think the Equilibrium is a fun tire, and you're going to enjoy it, especially if you like some of the gnarlier stuff. And you do a sport, guys. Don't forget the Parkers. The Parkers, yeah. The street legal going Parkers. On. Yes. And then, of course, SRT Off-Road. So we were talking about bike protection. Um, talking about radiator protection, all this kinds of stuff. This is why SRT kind of got into business is to help protect the bike at a much more economical price. Um, you can get pipes for your two strokes. You can get um, all the radiator guards, skid plates, shark fins, um, all the kind of stuff that you need to protect your motorcycle from srtoffroad.com. And that's a great place to do it because I love the fact that I can still go to my local dealer and get SRT off-road products so I can help up my local dealer and get great products to help out our sponsors for the show. Um, if you do shop on Amazon, go to seatime.com, click the Amazon banner there on the right, and go over there and buy whatever you buy. And it's just a little thank you. Helps us get some gas to give to Steven. Um, do all that kinds of stuff. What? Dot com won't get you there. What did I say? Seatime.com. I'm an idiot. Seatime.co. Did I really? I think I was thinking Amazon.com. And CO does not mean Columbia. Um. Uh, it used to. It used to. But it it used to. Anymore. Yeah, they usurped it so they could use it for more dot .co's or for since dot .coms are gone. Yeah, and do all that kinds of fun stuff and just help us out. Of course, I'm Brian Pierce. This has been episode 206. This is Papa Pierce. Um, I don't know. Right now, honestly, we've got Seat Time Adventures and then TKO. Those are kind of the two things on the schedule. Um, we really want to be at TKO this year because of the fact that it's going to be on Red Bull TV. So that's going to be really cool to be able to support that. I think what we've done before has been fantastic. I'd love to keep doing the photo epics and the videos and stuff. Um, I don't know how media is going to change now that Red Bull is going to be there and how the event's going to change. We haven't really heard anything from that. Um, so we'll see. If once Eric Pernard lets us know, we'll, we'll let you guys know. Again, Apologies, we've had a couple of people reach out and say, hey, can you come to our event and cover this and do this kinds of stuff? And it's like, we would love to, but honestly, we don't have the funds to do that. So when we go, dad typically is one of the ones footing a lot of the bills for us to go to some of these longer events just because of the fact that it's so hard to get there. I got to go anyway. Um, so I just, say, I just wanted to say thank you, though, to everybody that's looking out and asking for us to be at different places. Um, if we could, we would. Believe me, if this could be a full-time gig, it'd be fantastic, but it's just a... Hasn't been in the cards yet. We'll see where the cards keep falling. Look around Instagram a little bit later this evening for a little bit of a tease. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, man. Peace.